Good morning, church. We're grateful to be in the house of the Lord with you this morning. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we love you. We are here for you. We turn our eyes to you. We give our attention to you. We give our affection to you. Have your way in this place. Have your way in this place. In Jesus' name.
Welcome, RCC. We are so excited you guys are here. God has something incredible for us today. And uh, right now we're going to go and take an opportunity to dismiss our kids. So let's give it up for them as they go. There we go. Come on now. I see a little baby Grogu backpack. That thing is awesome. The ears on the thing are crazy. All right. I want to go ahead and pray, and then we're going to jump right back into worship. So let's pray. Jesus, right now we come to you. God, we come knowing that some of us have had rough weeks. Some of us may have had great weeks. God, regardless of what has happened to us, God, regardless of what's going through our mind right now, we pause. God, and we enter into your presence. We pursue you. We seek you because you are the God that opens up the floodgates, God. You desire to open heaven up, God, and to touch our hearts, God, to touch our lives. God, so as we sing our song of worship, Lord, I pray that you would show up and you would show off in our lives, Lord. We praise you.
brought me back to life. How can I begin to thank you for all that you've done for me? Jesus, to fully praise you, it will take all eternity. And just like Lazarus, Oh Lord, you brought me back to life. You brought me back to life. You brought me back to life. Lord, you brought me back.
deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Oh, worthy. You are worthy. this morning I just want to take a minute to invite you to just lift your hands right in front of you we're going to take a minute a few moments actually to just spend some time off the page we'll take our eyes off the screen
good provider. So, Lord, we thank you for this time of worship. God, we thank you that your presence is so tangible in this place, God, that your presence is so evident in this place. Lord, we thank you that you go before us in all that we do. And so this morning, God, we just take a moment to, to breathe you in. God, we take a moment to let go of all of our distractions from this week. God, we take a moment to, to, to let go of 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 our own desires, our own ambitions, our own agenda. God, and we just take a moment to let you be Lord in our life. Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for who you are and what you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Well, as you guys are uh, grabbing your seat, um, 
Pastor Andrew, uh, as you guys know, if you uh, saw on Facebook um, last week after service, or Monday after service, he tested positive for COVID, so he is not with us. He is feeling 100% better. I talked to him yesterday, and uh, I was texting him this morning and said, man, your dad is so cool. And he said, I know, I wish I was there. He's so bummed to uh, not be here with you guys this morning. But um, but um, speaking of which, I'm just going to get this show on the road. We have the man, the myth, and the legend here in the house. The reason why Pastor Andrew is so cool, he was the pastor in the cowboy capital of the world, Oakdale, California, for many, many years. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a River City welcome to Pastor Ron Houston. What am I going to do with this guy? I'm so happy to be here today from the cowboy capital of the world. <laughs> Hallelujah. Truly, I am happy to be here. And uh, it's always a joy. Wish I could be here every Sunday. And, uh, but when I get a chance to come, I just, uh, just love it. Love this congregation. You're wonderful people. It's such a blessing to be with. Let's pray, shall we? Holy Spirit. We want to be receptive to your word today. Open our hearts, open our ears. Help me to speak your word, your full counsel. God, I yield completely to what you want to say. I ask that you would encourage people today. There are people here, Lord, who have been through a lot of stuff. A lot of battles, a lot of trials, a lot of disappointments and discouragements. I pray you'll edify and strengthen their lives this day. God, this isn't going to happen without you moving upon us. So we thank you for your word. There's nothing like it. It gives us life. It gives us instruction. It gives us correction. It gives us insight and on and on and on we can brag about your wonderful and glorious word today. Bless your people with it, I pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen? amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Would you take well, take your Bibles, please? I forget. Cell phones, I mean. <laughs> you know, for 40 years I've been saying, take your Bibles. I'm a little, a little behind the times, I think, but if you'll take your cell phone and and somehow, whatever you do to get there, James chapter 1 is where I want to read. That's our text today. James chapter 1. I'm going to read three verses there, and then we're going to jump over to 1 Peter chapter 4, which isn't too, too many pages after that. James chapter 1. Everybody got that? Okay, beginning at verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy. Just say those words with me, count it all joy. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Some of there, you've been, been in those places lately, haven't you? When you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That sounds like a pretty good deal. Some of you are wanting some patience in your life. Well, let the Lord bring you through a few trials, would you? Realize there's purpose in that. And then over to 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12, Peter says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. And I pray that the Lord will somehow connect suffering and trial in your own heart today with his glory and with a revelation of who he is. How many of you have discovered this past year that Christians are not exempt from trials and difficulties and adversity? Anybody? Realize that? Okay, so you're not in for a shock today. 
if I tell you that, uh, you know, you're going to face some trials as a Christian in life. It's just something that's going to, to happen, and God's going to allow it to happen. And I believe, as I mentioned to the first uh, congregation uh, service here this morning, I believe that, and I'm convinced that the American church needs a new theology on suffering. We've had it too good. Christians around the world have it quite different from the way you and I experience Christianity in this country. We've had it nice. It's been nice and cozy. We are comfortable. We have wonderful sanctuaries and wonderful music and wonderful worship, and it's just been a good life for us. But how many of you realize that that is something that uh, can change? People of faith do fall into trials. People of faith do face adversity in life. And so often we've seen circles of Christians that think, well, if you got sick or if you're having problems in your life, there must be something wrong with your relationship with God. You must be lacking faith. But that's not true. People who are close to God and love God and walk with God every day find themselves as the scriptures tell us, falling into trials and facing fiery, fiery trials as well. The early church had a theology on suffering, and I think we need a new theology on suffering this day and age in this country. Jesus himself said, John chapter 30, chapter 16, verse 33, he said that in this world you will have tribulation. And he said, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. Did you notice Peter says rejoice when you have trials, when you're facing fiery trials. James says count it all joy. And I find it quite interesting, those three words, count it all joy, those four words. Because it, it's almost like you've got to calculate. You've got to think a little bit. It's not, you know, he's not telling us that it's some kind of emotional response that you're going to put on a happy face and a smile, and you're going to fake being happy, and that's a real Christian. You know, grit and smile. A lot of people have thought that that's, but it's, that's not. He's saying, stop and think about it a little bit, he's saying. When you're going through a trial, the outcome of that trial is going to be that Jesus is standing there with you, and he brought you through that, and he taught you a few things. You've become more patient. You've grown in him. God brings good out of those trials. So he's saying something like, when he says, appraise that, he's saying, count it all joy. He's saying, you know, it's kind of like two plus two is four. You got trial. You got Jesus. The outcome's good. <laughs> things are going to be great. Good things are going to happen. And so we rejoice. It's not that we rejoice necessarily in our trials, but we rejoice in the results of our trials, what comes out of our trials, the consequences of our trials. That's what we rejoice in is what God, God, you are up to something here. This is tough right now. I don't like where I'm at right now, but I know that you are at work, and I know that you are bringing forth something in my life that is pleasing and honoring to you. And so for the believer, then, the trials add up to becoming more and more like Jesus. Something good happens. I want to share three words with you today that are very special, very dear to my heart, because it's helped me to navigate some of the trials in my life. Back in 2017, a day after my son Andrew's birthday, Susie and I, my wife, got the news that she had uh, stage 3 cancer in her breast, and it was like the world dropped out from underneath us. I mean, we, it was, we, were, we were in a new place. If you've ever been there, you know what happens. You hit the wall, and the wall is a hard thing to hit. And everything changed that day. Now, I like to say that, thank the Lord, she's cancer-free. God has healed her body. He's brought, yes, praise the Lord. And he's, but it was a trial. It was an intense trial for two years where we just... We're walking in the dark most of the time. You ever been there where you're saying, God, why? And he's silent. Talk to me about this, Lord. What's going on? What's going to And he's silent. But then all of a sudden, you realize he's sitting right next to you. When you realize that, there's really, you don't, you don't really have to have him say anything. 
just the presence of the Lord. So we got through that. So, so you know, the trial of her cancer, and then, then the COVID came into play, didn't it? And you, all of you have experienced the results, the consequences of that, and the trials that have come through that. Probably, like me, you have experienced the loss of loved ones. I had a couple of good friends that went to be with the Lord because of the COVID, and it was just a, our country was changed, and difficult things are going on, and you know, everybody all of a sudden is shut, shut down at home. You, I don't have to go over it with you. You know, it was a very, very difficult time. And there, the Lord gave me three words that I want to share with you today that helped me navigate, gave me insight and perspective. It gave me context and comfort. And today I can stand here and I can say I, I am learning to appreciate the value of the testings of God in our lives because of the outcome, because of what God will do through those times of testing. The three words I want to share with you today are easy to remember, and I, I, I want you to repeat it after me. The first word is the word uncover. Say it with me. Uncover. uncover. The second word <coughs> is recover. And the third word is discover. Amen. How many of you know you haven't discovered everything there is to know about God? There's a whole lot more, isn't there? Testing times are intended, in the, and God allows them to come into our lives because he, he wants to uncover something. He may want to bring something into the light, something to your attention. Now, I don't mean that God wants to expose you, that God wants to embarrass you, that God wants to condemn you. That's just not his character. That's, that's not something that the Lord will do. The devil does that. He's the one that, that, that exposes and brings condemnation, but not God. God's character is different that. He, he allows things to come into our lives for different reason. He allows pressures and trials to come into our lives because he's perhaps wanting to uncover something, something that you have not been seeing in your life, something that hasn't gotten your attention that he wants to bring to your attention, something that maybe he wants to deal with, and you're not aware of what it is. Perhaps there's something in your life that he wants to change, and you need a wake-up call. Perhaps God needs to, I need to allow this to happen, he's saying, in their lives so that they'll wake up so that I can show them something here, so that I can change this or that in their lives, or perhaps he wants to spare you from something. If I could let them continue walking on in the darkness here, they're going to go off a cliff. So at right about this point, God says, I better bring a trial into their lives that will wake them up so that they won't walk off a cliff here. Maybe he wants to spare you from something. He wants to show you something you haven't been seeing. Or maybe he wants to fix something in your life. You ever had God fix something in your life? I'm so thankful for that, aren't you? God has a way of straightening us out. You know, we're such a mess, aren't we? Such a, and God, just I love it, you know, just that progressive sanctification where God is continually, you know, just improving our lives and fixing things that are broken. Perhaps he wants to heal something in your life, but, you know, until you, you're aware of it, you know, he has to bring it out into the open so you can put it before him and and, and, and let God heal you. Or maybe he wants to strengthen you. Or there's something in your life he wants to do that you're not seeing it. You're not perceiving it. And so sometimes he will allow hardship and pressure to reveal areas of weakness in your life or areas of vulnerability in your life. It's like the, uh, my son has often used the example of the radiator in the car. You know, a leak is revealed in your radiator when it's under pressure, when the heat is on, right? Then you know you got a leak. And we learn a lot about others. We learn a lot about ourselves when we're under pressure. We see the good, the bad, and the ugly, don't we? If you want to really know somebody, watch them when they're under pressure. Their true character is revealed. And so God allows that to happen. He will allow us to fall into trials for the purpose of, hey, wake up and see this. I want to change this. I want to heal this. I want to fix that. I want to spare you from pain, 
and destruction, whatever the case might be. And so he allows this to come because he wants to strengthen us in those weak areas. And he wants to better equip us so that we can stand strong in the midst of trials, in the midst of storms that come in life. And so that's the first thing I want you to see today. That's, you're going to experience that as a child of God, that he's going to allow you to fall into trial for the purpose of uncovering something in your life, something that you need to see. The second word, testing times are intended for us to recover something. And that's important. God allows us to be tested that we might recover something that perhaps we've lost over a period of time, over a period of days, weeks, months, years. Example. Maybe you've lost the light in the Word of God. And God needs to bring a trial, allow something to happen in your life so that you'll wake up and you realize, hey, wait a minute, I get, I get strength from the Word of God, guidance from the Word of God. I feed myself upon the Word of God. And perhaps you've lost that hunger for the Word of God, and God allows a trial to come into your life so that you'll wake up and realize the delight and the strength and the life that there is in the written word of God. Or perhaps <clears throat> there's been the neglect of disciplined prayer in your life that God wants you to cover and get back to. How many of you know here that, in fact, you know, I, I think back on the time that my wife was going through her cancer and I was by her side and the, just a, my prayer life went from here to here. There's something about suffering that gets, will get you on your knees. There's something about suffering that will cause you to run to God and to fall on your face and to pray. And perhaps you've lost, you've neglected the discipline of that time alone, praying with Jesus each and every day. And the Lord says, I'm going to allow this trial to come so that they will get back to that conversation with me on a daily basis. Or maybe there's been the loss of the joy of the Lord in your life. And I'm not talking, when I say the joy of the Lord, I'm not talking that you go around smiling all the time and happy all the time. I'm talking about something that is deep within your heart that you can be going through the worst day of your life and that's there. And the Bible says in Nehemiah that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so there's that deep seated joy of God that not based upon circumstances but it's, it's there because you know him and you love him and you walk with him perhaps you've lost that and the Lord says I'm going to let him hit the wall here so that they'll wake up and get back to the joy of the Lord or perhaps you've lost your, your passion for the things of God or maybe you've lost your love for people maybe you've lost compassion for for lost souls. And the Lord will allow you to face a trial in order to restore that, in order for you to recover the love that you once had for people. Or maybe the loss of dependency upon God. That's easy to do, isn't it? You know, it's amazing how when things are going smooth and everything's right and you're having a great day and the sun is shining... We tend to just kind of drift away from a dependency upon God. We don't need Him. It's kind of where much of American Christianity has, has been in the last several years because we, we, we got up pretty good. And so, you know, we lose that dependency upon the Lord and, and the testing of our faith, the trials of our faith are intended us to, to bring us back. You know, that was a cycle of Israel. They would commit evil. They would be suffer judgment for it. They would start crying out to God in repentance, and the Lord would say, okay, I'm going to restore them, and I pour out my mercy, and they, a little later they go back to the same place again. And it was just a constant cycle. That describes a cycle in many of our lives as well. You know, that it takes a trial for us to get back a dependency upon the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. And so perhaps, you know, the testing of our faiths, in fact, it will force us back to that first love. Remember the first love? You remember what that's about? It's about that intimate 
relationship with Jesus Christ. Perhaps that's been lost. Perhaps your Christian life has turned into legalism and just a sense of duty. And, and, and that's what happened to the Ephesian church. And John had to correct that. And he said, listen, you have become lukewarm. I would rather you be hot or cold. But the way you are with this lukewarmness right now, I want to spew you out of my mouth. The literal translation is vomit you out of my mouth. It, it turns his stomach, I guess. So perhaps we re- need to recover the love that we once had with Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I was telling the first uh, congregation today it would be like a marriage. I'll use myself as an example. You see my wife Susie goes out shopping, and I do this already anyhow. I, I, I wash the dishes and I clean the kitchen at home, but let's, let's say she, she goes out shopping and she, you know, she's out and I say, well, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clean the kitchen, I'm going to wash the dishes, vacuum, do all of this nice housework here. And then she gets back and she goes into shock. And she says, why did you do that? And my response will be, because it's my marital duty. <laughs> that wouldn't fly, would it? But it's different if I would say, honey, it's because I love you and I care about you and I want to bless you. And that's That's the kind of love we fall from. We start serving Jesus out of a sense of duty instead of a love for him. And so God will maybe allow us to face a hard place in life so that we will wake up and and we can recover something that has been lost in our lives. That first love that we had for Jesus, to get back to that. The third word that I want to share with you are the times of testing that are intended for us to discover something, to discover something. Even though it was a, to say, a trying, difficult test that you went through, a very, very tough time, you, you discover that He is your God. You discover that you are His child. And had it not been for that test or that trial, you would have never discovered that He loves you like He does and that He is He is the all-sufficient one and that he's the one that will meet all of your needs. You discover that he's been there for you all along. Oh, I've had times in my life where I've walked into darkness and it's been tough and and, and you don't understand and you're confused and then you get to the other side of the trial and you take a deep breath and then all of a sudden you realize, wow, Lord, you were there all the time all the time, walking with me, bringing me through that, hadn't realized that, hadn't noticed you, you I was, noticed you were with me, but you see, when you, you get to those tough places, you discover, you discover that, that he's been there with you. He may have not said anything, but his presence was there. And I don't know about you, but I believe it with all my heart. There is no substitute for the presence of God. There's nothing can take the place of the presence of Jesus. He can be quiet all day long, as long as he's right there. As long as his presence, there's nothing like it. And so you go through these times, you know, these times of testing, and, and, and it's worth it because of what you discover, because of, of the new revelation that you get from God and the, the wonderful character that he is. And so that test becomes worth it, doesn't it? I heard somebody say it once several years ago. I've been racking my brain trying to remember who is responsible for this quotation. But he said this, no test, no testimony. No test, no testimony. God doesn't allow you to fall into those fiery trials and to face those tests. You're not going to have a testimony. But when you're in the midst of those times, you discover the presence and the power and the love of Jesus Christ. No wonder the Apostle Paul said, oh, to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings that I might be conformed unto his death. And so there is so much more 
for you to discover about God. But much of it will only come to you as he allows you to face those fiery trials and to go through that time of adversity in your life. That's where you discover the Lord afresh and anew. Over the several years of pastoring, I've had people come up to me many times. And they've said, Pastor, I need prayer. Would you pray for me? I am being tested in my marriage. I am being tested in my finances. I'm being tested at my, my job situation. I'm being tested in my relationships within the body of Christ. And I'm, I am always happy to pray with people like that. But I've realized that in reality, those aren't the things that are being tested in their lives. But what's being tested is our, our faith, the authenticity, the genuineness of our faith. That's what's being tested through circumstances. What's being tried is our trust in God. That's what's being tested, whether we will trust him to work in and through our circumstances, will we trust him to work in that marriage, in our finances, at our job, in our church relationships? That's the bottom line. Will we trust God to work in that situation? What's being tested is whether we really believe in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, where it says, in all things, in all things, right? God works for the good. That's what's being tested when we face those fiery trials. I like what Peter says from the passage of Scripture we just read a few moments ago, where he said, Todd referred to our trials as fiery trials. They are fiery. I couldn't help but to think of the book of Daniel. I have been, uh, within the last couple of years, I have been just drawn to the book of Daniel. I've saturated it. I've been read books on it. I've studied it. I've looked at the original language on, on certain passages, and it's just, it's just consumed me. And I've, as I've studied the book of Daniel, I have come to realize that it really, it's just so parallel to the things that are going on in our world today. The things that Daniel faced and Shadrach and Abend Meshach and Abednego are just so, so much like what's going on in our society today that that just has been incredibly uh, enlightening to me. And, and uh, I, I have particularly today drawn to chapter 3 of Daniel because something interesting happens in Daniel that I think we're in that chapter that relates to what you and I are going through today and what you and I will be facing in the days to come. King Nebuchadnezzar put up a statue, an image of himself, a golden image of himself. And he put out a decree and he said, everybody, when you hear the music sound, you are to fall down, you are to, be, to bow before the statue, and you are to worship the statue. Well, there were three Hebrew boys. And they said, no, we're, we're not going to do that. And so the king heard about it. The word got to him, and, 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 and he got angry, and he said, bring those boys down here. And he confronted them. He said, is that true, that you're not going to bow down when the music plays and the image is, is there? And uh, the boys said, you know, and then he said, you know, the king said, I'm going to give you another chance, however, and if you don't. Bow down the next time the music, you hear the music, you're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. Not only that, but I'm going to turn the fire up seven times stronger. That's pretty intense. I'm going to turn the heat up. How many of you have felt the heat being turned up in our culture? You haven't seen anything yet. He said, I'm going to turn up the heat. And so the boys... You know, they said, you know, <clears throat> nope, we're still not going to bow down because we know that our God, he is able to deliver us. But, and I love this, the boys said, but if he doesn't deliver us, that's a if not kind of a faith, right? 
If God doesn't deliver us, we still aren't going to bow down before the statue. That's commitment. You know what I like about this? It was, and you see it in the text. It's not like the boys said when the, when the king said, go, you know, you're going to get thrown in the fiery furnace if you don't bow down. It's not like the boys said, well, could you give us a couple hours? They're going to go meet over here, have a little conference, and we're going to pray about it. Their immediate response, and I pray to God that will be my immediate response, and your immediate response in this day and in this age when the devil's turning up the heat in our culture, that your immediate response will be that you don't have to pray about it. I'm not going to bow to any other God but the feet of Jesus. Nobody else. He's able to deliver me, and if he doesn't, I trust the Lord. What's the next best thing? You can't lose, right? You can't lose. You can, all you can do is win, whether you live or die. The Apostle Paul said, we are his. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So anyhow, the king, in fact, the Bible tells in that passage of Scripture, when, there were boys, when the boys said, there's no way we're going to bow. Our God will deliver us. It says that his, the king's countenance changed. And he was so furious and angry. And he called his men over and he says, go turn the heat up seven times. And the boys that went over there to turn up the heat, the Bible says that just getting close to the furnace killed them instantly. And they threw those boys into the, into the furnace. And, 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 and as King Nebuchadnezzar is watching, he looks down and he says, wait a minute. How, how many people do we throw into the furnace? He threw three in. He says, I see four people walking around in there now. Is our God great or what? Is our great, God great? I'll tell you what. And they saw it was Jesus that was in the furnace with them. And, and, and their fest, I, I would say their faith, not only was tested, but they got an A plus, don't you? And that's always the result of being tested and tried, is that Jesus will always come through. And Jesus will always bring Bring deliverance. The purpose of our faith is being tested and being tested, loved ones, is not just for us to see how we will respond when the heat's turned up, but it's to it's to see how God will respond as we stand in faith and watch what He is going to do in His own time and in His own way. So God allows these fiery trials that you've been facing in life for the purpose of uncovering, for the purpose of recovering something, for the purpose of discovering the loving, awesome, great, merciful God that you and I serve. Would you bow your heads with me and you can stand to your feet if you would, please. We're going to pray. Father, with the days that lie before us, as we face trial and adversity in life, I particularly pray for every one of my brothers and sisters in Christ in this place today, that they would have a new perspective on trials, that they would have a new perspective on the arena of adverse circumstances that we find ourselves walking through in this day and age. That there will be a new sense of, of strength and comfort as we face those hard times. I pray, God, that you would raise up men and women in this congregation who would have the faith of these young Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that when it comes to bowing, we don't even have to pray about it. We don't have to have a, a convention. We don't have to have a meeting, but we, we know right away in our hearts, because our hearts are fully committed and devoted to Christ, that we will bow our knee to no one else but Jesus himself. God, give us the insight that we need this day and age as the enemy turns up the heat as the culture becomes more and more the enemy of believers, that your people would stand in faith and stand strong 
and would face those trials with the prospect that God is about to do something great. And that if the world knocks us down, we just fall into the arms of Jesus. God, strengthen my brothers and my sisters today. Give them grace. Give them wisdom. And give them power. And help them to walk in victory each and every day of their lives. This I pray in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen.
can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on. There will be an end to these troubles, not until the day comes. Still I will praise you. Still I will praise you. You know, one of the things I tell our young people in times of uncertainty and in times of chaos and in times of trial, we go back to what's familiar to us. And I tell the young people, make yourself familiar with the presence of God because when times of chaos come and when times of uncertainty come and times of trials come, you will go back to what's familiar. And if you're not familiar with the presence of God, then you're going to go whatever is most familiar to you. And I, I wasn't a Christian, what those things were. And after I got saved, those, those times hit. I'm going to throw one of these microphones in the street. <laughs> That's one thing. I, I don't pray for patience because that would require me to be in situations and I need to exercise patience and I don't, I don't want to do all that. So... But I tell our young people, hold on one second. Okay. I remember in my own life, going back to things that weren't of God because those were most familiar to me. And my encouragement is as we just spend a few more minutes in worship, become familiar with the presence of God. Become familiar with his word because when those times come, and they will come, you will go back to what's most familiar. I don't want to be like the Israelites when they escaped slavery and they were in the wilderness as Moses, and Moses was gone a little bit too long and they said, oh man, what are we going to do? Moses is is not here. See, they weren't yet familiar with the presence of God, so they went back to what was familiar, which was the idol worship and, 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 and the Egyptian religions. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go back to my old life. There's nothing for me there. So, Father, this morning, as we worship you just for these few more minutes God I pray that we'd be able to recognize how real your presence is that we'd be able to recognize God how how evident your presence is right now God that you are desirous to hold us and you are desirous to to make yourself known in every situation and so Lord I pray that we would go out this rest of the week God experiencing your presence like we're experiencing this morning. And if you're going through something and need, need a little extra prayer, I'm going to have uh, Stephen and Kara, our men's, and, our, our, our men's director, and his wife come up. I'm going to have Tim uh, Van Gelder, one of our um, chaplains, to come up. And Pastor Brandon come up. Pastor Ron, if you would come up. If, if you're going through a trial and you need just a little, a little extra push, a little extra nudge, a little extra prayer this morning don't go through what you're going through by yourself God has given us a church body for a reason so we're going to spend a few more minutes in worship if you need to be dismissed we bless you in the name of Jesus we'll see you guys next week you can you can be dismissed but let's just spend a few more minutes in, in his presence amen